How's it going everybody? This is Matt. We're going to continue on this 3D Playground video. So where we left off last time, let me just bring up Fork here. I think we got a block showing. Alright, so let's take a look. And I did tag this old release as vid4, so if anybody's watching the previous video, they can find that source code by looking for that tag. We're going to go ahead and go on to video 5. This is up on GitHub. And I might rename this to just 3D Playground, and I'll tag what video it's for. So that's, I think that's how I'm going to handle it. In the future, I think it makes sense. Okay, so let's just go ahead and hit play where we left off from last video and see what we get. And it looks like we got our window popping up, and we got what looks to be a rectangle. It looks like the window resizing doesn't really resize the viewport, you can see. So normally what you do is when you change your window size you have this viewport you have the viewport change to the entire screen area I haven't set up that callback is why it doesn't do that so it just takes the original size and sticks with that so we'll do that this episode we'll set up some of these callbacks and we'll go ahead and we'll get the camera in moving around uh, kinda like a set of player eyes and a first person type of view so we've got most of the camera stuff here. We're basically doing everything in a main. Okay, so let's just uh, dive into it here. To get this looking like 3D space, because right now we're in 2D space, we have to complete this camera and shader stuff. And, and that's mainly what we're going to do today. Let's walk through it here. So we enter our main. We set up a camera. Camera we're not actually using yet. Set up our mouse input, set up keyboard input. From the last video, we set all these up, but they were just like prep because we weren't actually using them at all yet. Cut the window initializing, make it the current context, initiate pad so we can do our OpenGL stuff. And uh, we assign the shader to these files. And we load up our square, and then we, all we did was really render our square. Here is the reshape window handler. We got a mouse movement function. This is a first person type of setup right here. If you were doing not first person where you just wanted the, this X pause and Y pause to be the position on the screen, it would uh, you would basically assign those directly to the X pause and Y pause. So you could do like in, uh, for example, uh, you could have a boolean that says if, I don't know, maybe it was called first person. So if it was first person, it would report all of this. And then you could have an else, an else if, not first person. And otherwise, you would report as so. So we just need these. There's really no calculating to do. It's just directly the position of the screen. Just doing running auto formatting there, which takes me to the bottom of the file. So there's no first person boolean, obviously, but we could make one. We could say um, boolean first person equals, oh, we'll say true. But that's something we could toggle in our game logic if we wanted to. So maybe you go into your inventory and you want to just detect the location of the mouse rather than process it as first person controls or something like that. That's, that's kind of a standard case. I'm going to name this G first person. Uh, G is for global. I'm Yeah, I'm doing this as global just for now since they're not abstracted out into classes. Well, I tend to get sidetracked a lot when I'm programming. I just see things I want to work on or fix and I do it. So I'm going to have to do some careful editing to actually make this make sense for you guys. And uh, it takes a lot of time for me to do that. So I would appreciate any any feedback I can get from you guys. It does help a lot. It helps keep me on track if I'm doing something catastrophically wrong or if I'm doing something that's great then I would also like to know because I might not do it again if I don't notice I'm doing something that works if nobody says anything you know so the viewport should be updating which should change this but it doesn't seem to be doing that and I think the reason why is so while we have a reshape window handler is it actually being called ever so let's do a see out here it would be keeping that big white square in the center if it was. So let's just take a look here. No. See, I resized the window. It did not call the function. It would have 
it would have done the C out if it was. So it's not being called, and the reason why is we haven't told GLFW, which is our window handler, to, to call it. And the way we do that is, uh, let's see, after we initialize GLFW, we basically need to set it up. Let's make some functions that set up these handlers because they're not set up. The mouse one, the functions are here, but nothing's actually saying to use them. So we'll do a void setup reshape window handler. So on Visual Studio, you can press Alt Enter on these undefined functions and click the little define thing. And it looks like it takes us further down in our, our main. This window within a window thing is a Visual Studio thing. So let's go down here to where it was, where it created it. We basically want to call glfw set frame buffer size callback. So when the screen size changes, the frame buffer size needs to update along with it. And here it needs to know about our window and our it needs our reshape callback. So this reshape callback is what is called every time there is a change to the window. As you can see, it wants a window and a CB phone. So it has this defined, it's their own type, but basically it's a function uh, that needs to take a GLFW window and an int for width and an int for height. So what we can do is we can do X turn C void reshape callback GLFW window. So these are the, this is the signature it needs. I'll just call it window and we'll have a width and a height. And we don't really need to forward declare this, I don't believe. So we'll just put it right above this. And this that's what uh, this setup reshape window handler is going to point to. So now when this changes it's going to pass to this reshape callback the window, uh, the width and height, and we can do with those whatever we want. And what we're going to do is we're going to call our actual reshape handler that we programmed and we're going to pass it in the window, the width, and the height. And I know it's a, it's a weird triple function type deal, but it's, it's the way you have it have to do it in this case. So you have one that you call anytime you want to change what the handler is. Usually this is a one-time thing unless you're changing controls or something, but we'll see that later. And as you can see, updates the width and height as requested and changes the viewport, which is uh, what ends up changing the render space. You do need to call this setup reshape handler. If we'll do that, Oh, basically anywhere before the main loop, but after GLFW is initialized. So I think we could do it. Now our window probably needs to be initialized too, and probably the current context. And GLAD needs to be set up probably as well. So we should be able to do it after this. So we'll just call that. It'll set it up before getting to our main loop, and that should take care of it. Let's hit play and see if the window handling is improved. So there's how it started. Now when we resize it, our window resizes. As you can see, it is calling this reshape window handler a bunch of times, like with every little tick of movement, I believe. Okay, so it seems fine here. Seems fine. Seems fine. And yeah, now things are resizing as expected. So if you make a game or something, people will change the window. You can have the viewport update so that it doesn't squish all weird and stuff. If your window is exactly square, then the square will be square. And that's just because of how we have it set up with the shader. It's a very standard orthographic projection right now. Let's go ahead and get the 3D space going. That'll start making things a little more interesting because we will start to be able to move about our scene. We are actually not using these shaders yet. We're using the default shader. Uh, and the default shader for OpenGL just I think it just renders everything white. So we point to this shader and the shader doesn't throw back an error so we know it compiles because if we look at these files we'll see that it throws an error if they have they don't compile. So this is uh, compiling correctly 
but we have to actually use it. So the way we do that is we would do the shader program, which is that G shader that we compiled, and we just say use because it's already all set up, so we can just use it. And that will switch to these shaders before the render. And we also want to update them because if we hit play now, who knows what's going to happen. Okay, it's a build error. Uh, it says G shader is not identified. That's because we're in this uh, OpenGL pixel loader thing. And it doesn't know about it. So we can say, hey, it's an extern shader called G shader. Let's look at our main again here. Just take a peek at that. Uh, it is a pointer. So we're going to make sure we get that on there. And now it will know about it. But of course, we do have to include shader h object that is somewhere else externally. And if there's no errors, it does find it. And there we go. It looks like it, it uh, compiles fine now. However, there's nothing on the screen. And that's because we haven't pushed updates to the shader as required. We've already loaded up our square. We did handle that. And that pushes everything up to a vertex array called the cube VAO. But before we render it, if we don't do this G shader to use, it's just rendering to the default shader, and that's why it just works. But if we are, it needs more information because this is doing some calculations with a model, a view, a projection, and we haven't set any of those. So they're probably all null or zero, and that's why we're just getting a black screen. Now it is getting this in position because it's location zero. And that's basically the location in the vertex buffer array. So if we look at this, there is a VBO. And there's only one of them, and it's position zero. So, and we've enabled position zero. And what that is, is this here. So we do have this coming in, but we don't have these coming in. And so the outputs are not working as intended. So we need to update model view and projection, and that's where the camera comes in. Well, the model is going to be the size of your model, but the view and projection are going to be basically the player perspective. So let's go ahead and do that. So the model is pretty easy. Um, we're not going to change it or do anything too special with it. So all I'm going to do here is in this render code is I'm going to do G shader dot set mat four. The reason it's a mat four is because this is a mat four. So we want to update mat four and it's by the name of model. It's an exact string match. Basically we want to tell it what to set it to. We're going to set it to an identity matrix which will keep it the same size. Uh, that will be fine. Uh, GLM mat four and I believe we just put a one there that is an identity identity matrix. So that just kind of pulls it from that GLM library. Now we need to, do need to make sure we have GLM up here. Because it is customary to include everything your file uses, even if it's being pulled in from something else. We also need to update the view in projection. So we would do something like this. Uh, set mat 4 and the view. But what is this view matrix? So we have to get that. And let's see, we also need to update the projection. The projection is something you actually don't need to update all the time. I'll talk a little more about this in a second. But the way I'm doing it here is, I mean, it'll work, but it's not optimal. And the reason it's not, not optimal is because this is happening every single loop. So it hits this render function, this render function draws, and it, it does this every time. Well, once this model is set to an identity matrix, unless it's changing, we don't need to actually do it again because what's the point? It's already, it's already an identity matrix, so basically this is like set, set it to an identity or matrix again, every loop, um, but it's already one. So it's just a waste of processing power to do it if it doesn't need to do it. Uh, now if you are stretching or rotating or something, yeah, you're going to need to change this, but we'll address that in maybe a later tutorial. So the point I'm getting to here is we probably actually want to do this. Let me I'll copy this code. 
We want to do this before our main loop since it's a one-time thing right now. And just paste it here. So we're going to say use the shader and set that model matrix on that shader. And it's not going to do it over and over since we're doing it before the while loop. So we'll have to delete this one here. This projection is also really only set once and it will be set again if we resize the window or if we change our render distance or if we change field of view. This doesn't need to be changed all the time. If you move around and stuff, we don't need to update the projection. It's just when the screen changes in some other way, basically. So this we're going to end up just doing as a one-time thing as well. But we don't know what it is yet. That's why I've got question marks there. So it'll give me a little red error space where it is. And I'll show you how to get this projection in a second. In this view, yeah, we're going to need to update it. You don't necessarily need to update every frame, but you need to update it every frame where you move around because it's a new view. But if you're in the exact same space, you don't necessarily need to. We're going to make this a little easier because we're not we're not going to be tracking movement by like like sometimes people will have a did character move this frame or something, and if it's true, then they update the view, and if it's not, then they don't worry about it. I'm going to kind of skip over that because I'm simplifying it, and we're just going to set it every frame because we'll likely be moving most frames anyway. Okay, the projection. This all comes from the camera. And I started to set up the camera in last tutorial, but now we're actually going to use it. So we want to have a starting position. And the front, up, and right, these haven't been set yet. So we have the yaw pitch, field of view, render distance, and far render distance. We've got a constant world up, where we can use in our calculations. And it looks like I've defined all of these functions right in the header so that when I include them in the main it'll build them. So when we uh, instantiate the camera class we need a starting position so that's gonna fill out this position. We're gonna need a looking direction which is gonna be our yaw, a pitch which is how far up or down we're looking, and a field of view and this update camera vectors is a function that sets the front up and right based on these position, yaw, and pitch. So they're basically some vectors that point from your character. So here's where some other functions are built into this camera. And now this camera class, um, why I have tweaked it some, and maybe this is an old version of my tweaking, I'm not sure, but it originated from Learn OpenGL just for full clarity. So if you want to get this original file and see some other explanations of it, you can look at the camera on learnopengl.com and there's some similar explanations that may be worse or better view. I don't know, it just depends on the person. But I'm going to kind of walk through how to update the shader with this class. Of course there are other ways of doing this. This is just how I have it set up and this is a way that works. To update our view matrix, we're going to be calling this function and it looks like it already sets the view. So we've already set up a camera and we've set up the look direction to 270 and what else we got? And the pitch and yaw are over there. So we've got a camera, we just haven't actually used it and it looks like we're going to need to update it. If we want to do it here, we're going to need to make that extern. So extern camera G camera and that's just to use the one from the main that we instantiated. So what we'll do is down here we'll say G camera update view matrix and it wants to know which shader and we have access to that shader too so we can just pass it. Now it's kind of weird to call global and then pass it another global I'm gonna be honest here but it gets the job done in this case. I'll leave it to other people to figure out how to refactor. And your shader, of course, it needs to be named view, otherwise this won't work. So if we look at this setmat4 function, this handles all the OpenGL calls from that shader library or include that we have up here. So we're looking at shader.cpp. So when you call setmat4, it wants a name and a mat4, and then it calls, well, first it calls get uniform location. Um, saves it to the ID. So it needs this name to get the uniform location. And then it takes that uniform location and passes it that map 4. So this is actually two calls. One call to get the ID based on the name 
and then another one to update that ID to the matrix. So if you want to save yourself some calls, you could like keep track of all these IDs so you don't have to retrieve them every time. And we want to do the same thing for the update projection matrix. As you can see, this projection matrix sets it to a perspective. So if you don't want a perspective, there's a different thing to do. And this is using the GLM perspective to get a projection matrix. And I have another function here for get projection matrix. This just returns it. And that's for if you want to do it on your own. And we're basically going to do a very similar thing before, except that we're going to use the camera. G camera update projection matrix. And this wants that shader to know which one to update. And it's basically going to take this camera and push the projection matrix to the shader. Oh, and we don't need all this. We just need, that's it. The camera already has its data, so it's fine. So that'll handle this model and this projection. But we need to do the view every frame. And let's see, did we have that set up? Looks like we do update view. So this should actually now work. Uh, we'll notice that we can't move around yet because I haven't set up the keyboard and mouse stuff. But it should now give us a perspective view. This is going to look weird because it's basically just a box. Might not even work. Let's see what are we missing. Oh, we're just doing some have some syntax errors. It looks like. I think we just need to include the camera, which will be like so, since it's in the same folder. I think that's what's going on here. Yeah. Okay. And so now we've got a full red screen. That seems a little weird, but the reason is and the reason it's not white is because we're using a different shader. So somewhere in this fragment shader, we have set the fragments to, to red. And I think, yeah, we did that right here. So this shader is real hacky. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily go off this too directly. Or rather than calculating all the light, because I'm going to do that later, I just set it to this reddish hue, and that's what we're seeing. So that is actually part of the square, and we're just probably really close to it, or maybe even inside of it. It's hard to tell, but it's set to this color, so that seems to be working properly. And now what we can do is we can add in movement so we can move about our world and we'll see some more views of the square and it'll make a lot more sense. And now another thing we want to do in our main is begin to process these events we pull. So we basically, if we're going to move around in a first person, uh, what we want to do is make a function that handles that. So this GFLW pull events tells GLFW to Take a look at where the mouse is, what's being clicked, what buttons are being pressed. All of that is what this does. But to actually use them in your code, you got to do a little bit more work. Because while this says, okay, GLFLW, look at what's going on, it's up to the developer to make these callback functions when these events happen. And it's very similar to the way we did the, the reshape. So this mouse one, I'm going to move to its own little spot. Uh, I'll just clean up this code a little bit, make it a little more readable, keep the, the mouse stuff together. Because these reshapes kind of all go together, um, the way they call each other. That way, when you're scrolling through a giant file, more than 100 lines, you can actually tell what's going on. So we have mouse functions. And there's no actual setup mouse handler yet, so that's why this mouse isn't being used. We're going to need a similar thing for the key press. Looks like we got all these in here. I think I copied this in. Yeah, I've got like every button ready to go on this key press function. I just haven't actually called it yet. So we've got a key press. It might be more accurate to call this button press because it's not just keys. It, it also processes uh, the mouse buttons. So it's keyboard and mouse buttons. So maybe this would be better named uh, button press. So basically we're going to set up ASDW, the standard first person controls, and we're going to set up mouse movement for first person. That way we can move about. So let's go ahead and do a void setup mouse handler. There's there's multiple ways of doing this. I was just uh, reviewing some things. So you can call these setup handlers to switch between different things. So for the mouse handler, we're going to have one that's first person and we have one that's standard, uh, just as this mouse movement kind of specified. But we can have, I think we've already kind of abstracted that by having this first person Boolean 
because that just changes the way that this mouse movement reports either from first person to no first person. So I think we're actually okay there. And basically we just need to, in a very similar, similar way as we did this window, glfw set cursor position callback. And this one also of course takes the window and this glfw also wants a function which is this mouse handler. So this function here is the one that needs the signature to match. This, These actually need to be doubles on the to match the signature. So this signature actually wants doubles. So now this function it calls is this mouse movement one, but obviously it takes these doubles and they're floats. So we're going to go ahead and translate them to floats before passing to the function. Otherwise we're going to get some warnings. And of course we could do this with all doubles, but there's no need. And I think it interferes a little with some other calculations potentially. So we're just going to stick with floats because OpenGL likes floats and they're half the size of a double. So that's nice. So now once we set up this mouse handler, it will run this function anytime we move the mouse. And as you can see, it basically just changes the X and Y offset of this mouse input. And then it's up to us to move the camera based on this offset. And it looks like we have our mouse sensitivity in here. So these, these statics are things that could be abstracted out into a class if you had a class for this. So let's go ahead and get these moving our camera. And it looks like we're going to do that during each update basically. Now that we're going to be calling these functions automatically just based on the callbacks, we need to actually process the information. So we pull the events at the end of a frame, but I think we want to process them at the beginning of the next frame, or you can process them at the end. It will essentially feel the same, I believe, but you can play around with that and decide what is best for you. So let's make a function here. We kind of need to do a combination of things here. We'll call it cam movement. So in this we're going to need to do a combination of things that includes uh, keeping track of where the camera is, keep track of where the mouse is, keep track of which buttons have been pressed, and that sort of thing. We need to call, we need to get a, a button update by calling this button press every time. So in our main here, after we pull events, we want to process button press. So we need to run that. Maybe it would be better to call it process. And this just takes what GLFW is reporting and puts it into our structure. Process button press. And our structure is, of course, this keyboard mouse input structure. So it's just going to update all these Booleans every loop. And we take those Booleans from that keyboard mouse input struct, and we're going to handle that in our cam movement. We're going to have some statics in here just because we haven't abstracted it out. I want to fly speed. I think I'm just going to set everything constant. Yeah, we'll do a current fly speed and we'll, get, we'll just give it 30. That's pretty fast. Maybe we'll lower it down so we don't zoom around. Uh, maybe something like 15. So we want some no clip flying. So in, when it, every time we call this cam movement, which is going to be every loop, this file is getting a little bit long at this point, but basically we'll call it, say at the beginning of every loop, cam movement. So it'll take whatever keys and stuff's going on and move the cam accordingly before doing all the new rendering. So that's kind of the point of that there. Okay, so we got a current fly speed of 15. We Let's see. If we want to move smoothly, we need to be processing delta time. That's something we're not doing, but it's very easy to add in. Uh, we can sort of emulate delta time in a way by saying FPS, uh, we'll assume 60 frames per second. So this would be somewhat the velocity if you're rendering at 60 frames. Now this is just a hack to skip over the delta time. But the delta time, if you're running at exactly 60 frames per second, is going to be approximately uh, this number. So I wouldn't recommend doing this. To be perfectly honest, I would recommend actually calculating the delta time, but I'm just doing this to save time, and I will cover delta time in the next video, and we'll make it not so hacky. And we're going to times this by the current fly speed, and what this allows us to do is adjust the fly speed. So if at some point we determine, okay, we're going way too slow, 
we can add in a little function that changes this way maybe with the mouse wheel or something and that way we can uh, still be calculating based on delta time but update the y speed this program will run as fast as your computer will run it so things will be different on every computer unless you do something like a velocity calculation and that's this just makes it seem like a 60 frame per second no matter what so even if you're running at 200 it'll be calculating with this delta time still and uh yeah well that's that's a bigger topic i'll get into more into that later so we want to process the uh wasd movement here and we're going to add a few functions here let's see our we're going to hold a direction placement and this is going to be the new direction that we're moving uh, that's different from last frame so since it's static it only sets to this zero once and it's going to be updated every frame and we're, we don't call this keys what do we call it we're calling it g keyboard input it's a pointer so this is just different from the other code I was working with from something else. You basically need to reference that structure and see if the boolean is true or not. And if it is, then we update all this stuff. Uh, I guess we also want our movement front. And to get that, we need to call from our camera. We basically need to know where the front of the camera is and this is just a little unit vector that points forward or the way we're currently looking so the camera holds that in the front and that's uh that's what we do we want to get that uh, right to begin with so these statics while they stay in the function every time they only get initialized once uh, so this equals is only happening the very first time and then beyond that we have to control it manually so that's just the way these statics work and all these AA viewports should actually be this G camera stuff because that's how we're doing it in ours so if we press W we go the direction placement is plus equals move front times the velocity so we're moving forward um, this uh, if you press S you're moving backwards there's a minus on the move front if you press A you're moving to the left so we take the right vector and we go negative that direction. We're going, we're pressing D, we're going right, so we're plusing the right direction. So this is basically handles that WASD movement with our current setup. Uh, we could also do some things to go up and down, and that would look something like this. Let me get uh, all these updated to match our code. Every time this cam movement is called, it's going to process this. Uh, so if you want to go up, you have to just plus press spacebar. If you're holding shift and pressing spacebar, it's going to move you down. So this just gives you a way to go up and down uh, by space to go up, shift space to go down. So you can change that, of course, how you want. But that's that's just an example there. And then last thing we want to do is we actually want to change our position in this camera. So if we look at our camera functions. We should see one in here called increase position. So this increase position is the one we're looking at. We want to do this at the very end. We'll call from our G camera this increase position function. And the amount is our direction placement, which has all been calculated. So every frame we're going to move. And then we want to just reset a few things before the next loop. That way we don't get odd things happening. One of those things is this direction placement. We're going to set it back to zero. Uh, another way we could do this that might be a little cleaner is we could do it at the top of this every time, but I'm, I'm doing it at the end. Reset for next loop. And our move front, let's see here. Yeah, this here, we're going to update that as well. And we're basically going to say, okay, it's the new position of the camera. So it'll be basically be this again. So that just updates them at the very end. Uh, yes, very much we could we could put these right here, like so. That way, it updates every frame just as well. So it's kind of a matter of how you want to do your code. There's no reason to set it twice on the f first run. So yeah, these statics only happen the first time, but if we 
put it below like this, it'll, these, this will happen every time. So that'll update those before the next run. Essentially the same as doing it at the end. Uh, so I'm just going to do it that way in, in our case. So we should be able to at least see that. So, okay, we'll run our file. I'm going to press S to back up. Very good. i press W to go forward. Now if I press A, it'll go left. D, I'll go right. And you can see the perspective kicking in for this cube now. And we should be able to resize our window in any way, continue our movements. Now you can see our mouse doesn't do anything yet, and that's because we haven't set it up. But WASD is working. Space goes up. Yep, shift space goes down. Okay, so the last thing we need to do is we need to set up our mouse movement. And what we're going to look at for that, let's go back up to the top here. We've got this mouse input. And the only thing this mouse input really is, is an X offset and a Y offset. And that is updated every frame already by this handler. So anytime we move our mouse around on the screen, it is updating. But we need to actually do something with it. And we can do that right in this cam movement. We might as well. Of course, this could be done in a separate function. Okay, so mouse movement should shift the, it should move the pitch and yaw. So we have an increase yaw, increase pitch. We can use those to uh, move our, our camera around. And since we already know the offsets, all we need to do is pass these the offsets and the rest is handled. So the yaw is you know left or right. You can spin kind of indefinitely how you want, but looking up and down, this is locked to 89 degrees. So you, you can look almost straight down, almost straight up, but only one degree off. So that, that way it doesn't get all weird and you can flip upside down and stuff. And let's see, where do we want to do that? So we move the, the placement of the camera already uh, at the end of our button press, but we also want to move our mouse. And I guess this would be an okay place to do it. We basically just take our, our G camera and we'll say increase pitch and yaw. I think, uh, yeah, I have a function that just calls both of these and then updates the camera vectors. So we, we'll do that. Um, and that, of course, is going to be from the G what, mouse input. So we need to look at these variables to decide how much. G mouse input uh, X offset, G mouse input autocorrect is not helping on this one, Y offset. And that's just what it wants here. It wants the yaw offset, the pitch offset, and it'll take those and call these two functions and then update the camera vectors. So now we should be able to, just based on adding this at the end of our cam movement, change our front vector. And that's fine because it's going to get updated before processing the next keys. Now it might be the case that this is better somewhere else, like before. We'll see. Let's just see how it works. Sometimes you have to really think about the order things are being processed. So we've got our window. Let's back up a little. If we move our mouse, uh, nothing really happens. Now we have to question why, and the reason might be, well, first let's see if it even built. No, it built. Okay. We're calling cam movement, so this should work. But are we calling the setup mouse? Hold on. I think we're not actually processing the mouse yet. Like, we built the functions here, right? Mouse Setup mouse handler, mouse movement, but we didn't actually call it. We do set up the reshape here. But we also need to set up the mouse handler. That way, GLFW actually updates that struct. So that's why it wasn't working. Looks like there's a build error now. Set up mouse handler is not defined. Uh, this giant function of keys is really taking up a lot of space. I'm going to minimize it here. Set up mouse handler. Oh, OK, so we just need it here so it knows that it exists. Just a little forward declaration there. So there we go. That should reduce that complaint. And there we go. Let's back up. Now we can move with our mouse and sort of get first person. But as you can see, the mouse is, uh, we go off screen, it kind of stops. I don't know. Like you couldn't actually play a game like this, right? Because <laughs> the mouse is all weird. Uh, but in other ways, I can move around. I can move my mouse to look around. If you're using this first person control, you have to disable the mouse. And that's a GLFW thing that basically hides the mouse and leaves it locked on the screen. 
if you're first person, you want to do that. So I'll, I'll just make a function here, I guess. If G first person. So if first person is set to true GLFW, set input mode on the window. So we'll pass in our window and we tell it the cursor. And then we want to tell it how the cursor should be. And this is cursor disabled. So if it's first person, we're going to disable the cursor. And what disabling the cursor does is, it, kind of as I explained, it doesn't actually make the cursor not work, as you would think the word disabled kind of means, you know? It actually just hides it and lock, locks it on the screen. So that's a GLFW thing. I know, terrible name, since it doesn't fit what it does, but GLFW, that's what they call it, so you just got to get used to it. So now if we move around, the cursor is now locked to the screen, so we can just keep keep scrolling. So uh, and I've lost the cube. There it is. So this is ideal for a first-person setup, having that disabled. And it looks like I'm moving slightly. Oh, I know. Okay, okay. This is interesting. So there's something else. One more mistake I made. So my hands are off the keyboard and mouse. Hands off keyboard and mouse. It's still moving. So. Now you'll notice you can't get your mouse to close the window, uh, so you might want to set a key to quit, or you can just press Alt F4. Okay, so the reason for this, of it keeping its movement, is we don't reset the X offset and Y offset. They're staying the same. So even after we process this movement and increase the yaw and pitch, the X offset and Y offset are not actually changed until we move the mouse again. So what we want to do here is after we process them and say, okay, we've processed that movement, we want to set these to zero because the movement's done. So that, that was that oddity of it continuing its movement. So now when we launch this, if we get a successful build here, we should see that now when we stop moving, it stops moving. Okay, well, I feel like we have gone over a lot. I hope this helps you guys get your stuff set in 3d mode and some uh some basic movement going on in your program i will upload this code uh, with its new commits uh, tagged as video 5 and a link below happy coding everybody happy new year don't give up if you have any questions ask them below peace out guys love you all take care